Hello, hello, hello. My name is Josh Kopel, and welcome to our latest town hall featuring Elizabeth Tilton. I uh, let me go ahead and share the screen to start this party. Start. Oh, technology. There we go. I believe the screen is sharing now. Um, welcome everyone to the latest. Uh, the latest town hall featuring Elizabeth Tilden of Oyster Sunday. Um, the reason I was so excited to uh, to host her on a town hall, and I knew you would be excited as well, is because she's brilliant. She's like one of the smartest people I know, and we need a lot more of that in the industry. So for us to be able to amplify her voice and her genius, I, I think it's going to get us all a lot further. Um, Elizabeth, welcome to the town hall. Thank you. What an intro. <laughs> I'm very... <laughs> flattered over here. Thank you so much, Josh. Good to see your face. Give, you as well. Can you give a little background on you and a little background on Oyster Sunday as well? Yeah, happy to. Um, first off, I was joking upon arrival that I picked the right mug for this, my uh, rocket ship. <laughs> my, uh, very serious over here. Um, but yeah, I'm Elizabeth. I'm the CEO and founder of Oyster Sunday and a little bit of my background to keep it short. Um, I born and raised in New Orleans and ended up in the back of house after kind of not going to medical school and making that choice and went to New York, was at the team at Momofuku from front of house management and then eventually to corporate on the branding team. And then had the opportunity of joining as head of brand for a company called WMP where I was, we're doing everything from e-commerce wholesale and a whole design company from ideation through manufacturing of hard good products um, in the industry nationwide. But I had started Oyster Sunday in 2019. The concept started building in 2012, but really put it into motion in 2019, just in time for the pandemic. But in that kind of in between was really looking at the industry and saying, recognize and working in a restaurant group and then now to start up and seeing how um, a corporate office for independent restaurants was so necessary, but really hard to obtain if you were just one brick and mortar, but those services were needed across the board. So we created Oyster Sunday, which stands for operating system to really address financial strategy, operations, HR, branding and communications for independent restaurants, coast to coast, but not necessarily tethered to one restaurant group. Well, and you and I got together because of all of the stuff that you did at the beginning of the pandemic. Can you talk about what your company put together in those early days? Yeah, we pretty much had come out the gate and made our first hire and um, I guess it was in January 2020. And so we were now a team of two, we're onboarding new clients, had finished up a couple of projects and then COVID hit, needless to say. And by the 16th, we had put out a call saying that we were going to do free consultations to anyone in the industry. No question was too big or too small. And although we were only two, we had built this network over the course of a couple months of um, CPAs and legal counsel and operators and CFOs and really kind of were able to tap into this community to answer questions that either we couldn't answer, but people needed to address very quickly. So we had started with free consultations and then from some of the questions we were answering, which is really relevant to what we're doing today, it's we were able to really put out resources that were timeless to address things we didn't know or to address things that we kept hearing. And from that, we were able to really kind of find these common fibers and some issues or some questions that were really pervasive throughout the industry. And I think we're going we're gonna to tackle a bunch of those today. Um, top, top of mind for everyone, uh, I think, it is labor and this overall labor shortage. And, and so just to dig right in, um, what do you think is causing the employee deficit within the industry? I really think that what came very apparent is the volatility of the industry and like the lack of consistency. And I think that there was, I mean, that was number one, right? We, everything shut, we were constricted, cash flow was tight, decisions were really quick to furlough, there was not enough in the bank, right? So this is the volatility on people's lives was number one. And mixed with this really kind of, I think it untrenched and uprooted a lot of the gaps in inequality that we knew existed or maybe ignored for a long time as an industry or became complacent in it. And I don't necessarily point paint fingers at anyone. I think it was a, a combination of just piling on of decades and decades of decision-making. But I think in that, you know, people kind of left the industry to find work. I mean, this is a really long period of time. It's not a storm. It's not a weekend. It's not, it is months now a year in. And I think not only did they defect from the industry, but potentially they left their cities they were in. So these major hubs of food innovation, such as New York and San Francisco and Chicago, I mean, I would argue that the evolution of food culture is maybe happening in secondary and tertiary markets. 
And I think that that's where potentially more labor would be had. But I think that it was the, the instability um, that really caused people to defect, in my opinion. I think that's so interesting that you say that because I hadn't really thought about it until you mentioned it. But 100 percent, I, I mean, being being based out of Los Angeles. We have seen a mass exodus of hospitality workers back to wherever they came from. You know, um, I, I know that generationally they talk about how the millennials, um, by and large, are moving back in with their parents at this stage and trying to to regroup and uh, figure out what a post pandemic world looks like. Um, and working, I think too. With, oh, sorry, Josh. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think too, like in that exact moment, if you, because a lot of people in the industry, it was a really amazing, like low barrier of entry and amazing opportunity to have like this work and then also potentially do other things in your life and to potentially be, explore other like interests. And, and I think there's like two sides, obviously people have as a vocation and then the other is that it does and provides flexibility in one schedule to do other things. But if you don't have the overhead to your example about going to your parents' house, you don't have the overhead cost then people are going back to school. They're going to like training programs to find alternatives to get into other programs like, you know, design company, you know, so on. So I think that we've heard it time and time again and you and big cities are really hurting big time. We're hearing it from clients coast to coast. Well, and so I, I guess to kind of unpack it and we'll get a little deeper into it. It's it's one of the only industries I've found where you can work in it 30 years and it's still being treated like a gig, right? There's no, there's no medical insurance. There's no subsidy healthcare, there's no retirement program. Um, do you feel like that is having an impact? Absolutely. I mean, if we're talking about, I, I think a lot of this shook a lot of people to sit there and say, what is worth? What is everything worth? What is existence where you put your time, who you see? I mean, even just the interaction with humans, you had to decide who was in your pod. Like all of this kind of folds down to how you spend your time and where you make yourself vulnerable. And I think the industry inherently didn't, it didn't have the flexibility or they like the cash flow or whatever the business structure you name it the, all the var- the variables that impact that to protect people and i think that that's why if we couldn't protect them in an, in the middle of a pandemic like that's a, that's a huge issue and i think people are trying to find other ways that if what's it worth and if, as much as they loved it well and, and i think an analysis or, or you know questions related to the problem also beg questions related to solutions as well and you know, how do you think employers out there can differentiate themselves to try and drive people, if not back to the industry, back to their, their specific business? I mean, I think, I mean, first off, it's like how, I guess there's so much packed in there as, as I'm sure we'll get into a lot of the financials and operation decisions, but I think that what's going to happen is that, well, not only have people defected, but people's, a lot of operators are keeping their teams leaner. And in that, I think people can make decisions off of if, if these are the labor models and they're leaner, like where can we find, can we then find work cash flow to then provide benefits and healthcare and protecting people in that sense? Or maybe it's even continuing education and cross-training and referral programs and getting people to, if you find some new manager, you get, you get a bonus. I think there's different incentives that we can create to find good talent and to retain them. But it's not only just finding them, it is the retention part that's so so important because not only is labor unbelievably hard to find, it is very expensive to continue to retrain every time you lose them. And you have to train right when you're leaner. So it's just gonna, it's gonna be this perpetuating cycle. But I think if you're able to find in interesting creative ways to find talent, and then more importantly, find a life cycle of that employee at your, at your company and retain them is gonna be, I mean, I find it, it can't be just finding them. I, I couldn't agree with you more. For the folks that are listening, uh, this is a conversation that you are a part of. So I encourage you to drop comments and questions in the chat in the Q&A section. Um, we want to hear from you. Uh, I'll do a fair amount of the talking. Hopefully Elizabeth does more, but we want to hear your voice as well. Move on to the next question. How is the labor model changing or evolving for restaurants? Um, I, think, I think it's becoming, and I think this taps into the how to find employees. I think it's becoming more team driven and people driven before. I think it was always in every, the team supported the intention of the operation. They supported the chef's vision. They supported the business, um, the, you know, the financial model, the, whatever it was. But I think what's happening is we're swinging back to people capital being just as important in my opinion. 
And I think that comes back and I kind of alluded a little bit to it, but like cross training your employees, remaining lean, because all of a sudden, like, will a Somalia be on the floor? Will a be there to actually help guide someone at that salary? Or can you cross train your entire front of house team that also can hop into the back of house and, and be on the line and have a more versatility? I think that that is definitely happening. Um, and I think on top of that, it's not only like how you're structuring their job descriptions and their responsibilities. It's, it's also when, when you're making choices about being open, like when are you open? Does do you have to be open seven days a week, all three, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or do you only have the capability of being open five days a week for dinner? Does that may actually make more sense for not only your P and L, but your business model and your labor I think that's also important to note is like that alternative operation structure. And then there's pay structure. Is it a bigger base rate? Are they on salary? Like all the different incentives on that front. Um, and then finally, I say beyond just how you're paying them and compensating is like, it's also on top of that is like the bonus structures or incentive structures that you create in your company. I think all of those impact labor challenge and like how we address labor challenges now. And I think you can kind of pick which makes sense to your, your business. And you don't, I mean, it's hard to do them all. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but I think it's important to identify like what is, what's important for your company. And then how do you find those to, to bring it in? One of the things that I love about you and the conversations that we have, and I, I think we can even unpack it further is as an industry, we need to be asking better questions. And I spent the, the majority of my career asking the wrong questions. Like, how do I get busier on a Monday? When they, the, the real question is, should I be open on a Monday? Does that make sense? You know, how do you how do you monetize seven days a week when the reality is I could probably net more, even though it would negatively affect my top line, by only being open five days a week. And, and so yeah. they, there are a lot of those questions out there, right? Absolutely. And I think it's too, it's like if your team should only be, if if your best team and the best business structure should only be 10 people, but you need 20 to do seven days of service. Are you serving anyone? Exactly. If you're not at that point, you're not serving your guests. You're not serving your team. You're not comp- you Maybe you're not compensating them. You're, you're the inconsistencies of that. And I just think it's a hard decision to do that, but I think sometimes it's the right. You know, something that somebody brought up to me recently, and it was it, it was an apples to oranges comparison, but I want I wanted to present it to you and get your thoughts just because I thought it was a really interesting way to think about things. They they were talking about the future of the restaurant labor model, and they they mentioned the Apple store. And they said, you go to the Apple store, it's heavily staffed, but they have two classifications of human, right? Like producers, people that are fixing things, and then they have helpers, and they have helpers everywhere, but these people. People are nondescript and they can do many, many, many different things. And they were like, that could be the future of restaurants where, you, you know, you're fully staffed at, at a lower level, but for the most part, consumers are able to kind of choose their own adventure and they're able to shop on their own and they can handle 90% of the entire experience on their own if they so choose. But if yeah. they need help or if they need guidance, there are people there at, at a volume high enough that they can help anyone who needs anything whenever they need it. What do you think about that? I think that's interesting. I always think like we're, we, um, well, I also want to come back and bring in the conversation around technology into that as well. But I would say to answer your question immediately, I mean, I totally agree. I think there's a lot of beauty in a floater. I, we were working with one hotel right now. And as we keep talking about, what is that maitre d? What is that like floater that just fills it? You know, there's this there can be specialists and there can be like an oper- like everyday all catch all operator that has, and not only just catch all, that's not a fair enough term. It's more of how do you properly train them to do everything and to do everything Absolutely. well to the standard in which you have. And there can be people who excel at certain stuff. And then you can prioritize that as part of their, their main scope or the, what their responsibilities are. But I think, yeah, I think we should be talking to our team more about, PLs and numbers. So you're not just going towards like you're, you're training for multiple different aspects of the world where they understand how to manage technology and they understand how to read a PL and the value of that. So there's, there's more in it than just being like meet these sales goals. Um, but I definitely agree. I mean, I think there, it can, it can change pretty quickly. Well, to distill out what you've covered, because I think it's really valuable. What, what you're seeing with the restaurants you're working with is cross-training, 
paring down labor, paring down hours of operation, trying to figure out what, what's essential and what's efficient, right? Yeah, but I think it's also not, it's more of like what makes sense for your business. It's not necessarily everyone's not doing that. But I do think there are some operators who are like, we're only doing outdoor service. We are only, we are not going to open our dining room because it just, it doesn't need to. And we're going to make that decision for us and our team. You know, and I think that's important in being, and saying the incentive. And I think the reason why there's a deficit in labor is that, but I mean, obviously people are leaving the industry, but at the same time, like if we, do we need to be going all the way to hundred percent right now? Like, is that, is that actually right for the business model? Like, and your cash flow and all the decisions, like it's the incentive is to fill butts and seats, open every door, open every table, but can, is it actually good for your purchasing behavior and the wine on stock on, you have and the buying power and the, and the prepping all the digital side of it. And it's like, if, you, if that's not all in order, I mean, I think there's, there's a beauty to being more incremental. Agreed. Knowing that people are hurting and cash is hard. I don't want to dismiss any of that because I know there's probably people listening that are like, I need hundred percent of sales, but I think that we, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to like dismiss that by any means. And I'm very empathetic to it, but I just think that it's also hard when you're to train a double a team and train them is also really time intensive in labor. So we have to kind of strike that balance. For sure. Uh, we, we had somebody reach out and they said that they, they were opening, they had opened during the pandemic and they're curious to know uh, how did they transition back to normal operations? And I would also add to that. What is normal operations now? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I mean, I'll start with saying, and it's something we talked about in April last year. I think we need to kind of throw normal and that word out the window. I'll put in quotations. Um, I just don't think there's going back to what we perceived as this golden age of food in 2019 as normal. I think we can, we will always, there'll be a lot of different growth and have a different golden age of food. But I think what hundred percent sardines in a room is not going to be what people, it's not necessarily what it's not necessarily what's going to happen. And it's not necessarily what customers want right now. Um, so I kind of want to start with that, but I actually, I, I enjoy this question. And I think it's one of those things we actually, I find myself gravitating towards reading more about when, when I think about how do I inform ourselves of what's coming down the pike as, as an industry, I actually, I do read food, food and like blogs and podcasts and listen to them obviously, and um, read publications, but I, I'd actually kind of turn my attention more to like technology and where it's going because I think that we can glean a lot from it. I think about even thinking about, well, I, I, this has relevance, I promise. Thinking about the, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots and I can see them. So when I'm thinking about technology and I'm looking at social media happening and I'm thinking about Clubhouse and the growth of that and then Facebook and Twitter and everyone copying it. And what to me that actually is telling me is that what those, all this technology is trying to do. And I think that there's a lot to be said because they're both services. Tech, and social media is a service, hospitality is a service. All of, this, all of technology and all these social media platforms are clamoring out what the clubhouse did because they don't want to lose their engaged, informed, and dedicated audience. When I think about restaurants, we have to do the same. Like we, the most important part when I think about going back to normal, it's that it's reevaluating what normal is going to be for us. And I think that's like feeding your hyperlocal community and knowing who your customer base is, understanding your data. And there's a very, you know, I think that there's, it's very important to do that because we have to figure out how do we keep those people engaged in order to have normal, like have a normal service because we have to, we have to have engaged audiences, retention. And I think that's just really important in that we, I kind of turn to those industries as an indicator of what normal operations will be. Um, I, I hope that somewhat directly and translates to what you're asking. Well, it, <laughs> I, I think it does. And, and I'd like to drill down just a little bit deeper. So it's, I, I think what you're explaining is, is that ultimately it's going to come down to the data, right? That when you transition back to whatever normal operations are, those normal operations are going to be dictated by what you're seeing in the data. That way you can respond to customer demand, the demand of the community, and then meet that demand. Absolutely. And I, I definitely agree with that. And I think that's data of understanding your CRM and your sales data. And, and I think that we have to, we have so much at our disposal to know about that when it comes back to transitioning to a normal operation, I think the more we understand not only our PNL and what our, what we want our labor and food cogs and bev cogs to be, we also, I need to understand what people want and we have to kind of marry those two together. 
And so when it comes to identifying what a normal operation is, it's more of saying, can we may need to rebuild our business model to be able to actually identify what normal operation is, because it could be only, it may have been built off hundred percent capacity, but it might only be 60 for a while. And we need to figure out how mm -hmm. to make up that 40% and normal operation is going to be like alternative revenue streams and that we've chatted about before. And I just think that that's where we have to kind of, um, and opening door pandemic is hard because we don't, you're making up what normal is right now. But I think just listening to people and being and meeting them where they are and where they want to go is going to help find where that where the company and where operations can be. I, I would also argue that if you open during the pandemic and you're asking this question, you've survived through the pandemic. So, I mean, trusting your gut, looking at the data and making informed decisions, you could probably get there on your own. Mm -hmm. Next up. What are some of the best practices for online ordering and how important will it be in the future? Uh, speaking of data, <laughs> um, number one is know is own as much of it as you can. And again, I keep bringing data in the broadest scope of it. I, I think it's when I say in particular, when looking at online ordering, a lot of times when we're using third party and it's something that all last year got a lot, a, a lot of great publications wrote on this and happy to share some resources, but I think the most important part is that if you, the more you can keep and understand who you're talking to and who you're serving, the better off you'll be to be able to continue to develop an online and ordering pro, um, um, foot, like a footprint for that. So I think number one, I would argue is keep it native as possible. So maybe I think there's a lot of POS systems and I'll use Toast as an example for the sake of this conversation that they went straight to Toast, um, Toast tab which you integrated right into your website and you were able to collect through your POS system, all those online orders. And they came out the gate fast at that. And I think before, you know, technology is finally keeping up with, or is catching up and developing quickly. It was like a pressure cooker last year. But I think that if we're able to keep it as native as possible, we're collecting all the information we need about what people want, when they're ordering. So you can even then indicate Who's coming back? Can you can you give them an extra incentive to come back again? How are you talking to them? Keep them in your email flow. And on the same side, you can prep your kitchen. You can think about service and mise en place and like when you think you're going to get a pop of online ordering. I think it just is more you can hold on to because third parties, as we know, doesn't hold. There's no transparency, and we we kind of get lost in the shuffle of on our own side. And I think it goes back to, you know, really relying on your numbers. They tell you what people want. Um, and most importantly is like when it comes to menus, like, so we can understand all the data and how the workflow and the customer experiences, but when people receive food, like really building a menu that's conducive for travel and it does it should not be like, we can't be sending, potentially sending like um, beautifully cooked lamb chops to travel for 30 minutes. Like that may not be the best way to do it. And I think that we should just really build menus for travel. And um, I think those are kind of my, my main ones, but there's also a really great company called Figure Eight that logistics who have been really pioneers and huge advocates for helping restaurants keep it native, which I would recommend che checking out. They have great resources too. And then the second part of that question is how important will online ordering be in the future? I think... Convenience is here to stay. I don't think it's going, it's definitely going to drop. I think that there's going to be, we're going to, I think online ordering sales are going to drop. They're going to be made up by in, by on-premise. And I think that they'll also start getting carved away a little bit for like subscription, which are coming down the pike. Um, so I'm very intrigued to see where that pie chart happens and how it morphs over the course of the year. But I do think that people are still going to want the convenience of delivery or takeout. Um, I think that some people are choosing to also do it native, like to, to also do their own delivery if they have the scale and can do that. Um, so I'm intrigued to see it's, I mean, it's a liability. There's a lot of different logistics that come with that, but if you have a restaurant group and you're in a small radius, I think it makes sense, but I think it's going to be here for the future. And I think a lot of restaurants are wanting to like cut it off and be done with it, but I, I think it's a little too soon. I know it's just can be disruptive, but I think try to make it work for you and not against you and be it, be a service and, and revenue stream, um, but, and try to reduce as much friction as you can. 
I, I don't want to I don't want to let that point pass because I, I, I think that what you just said was super relevant in the way that online ordering is a gateway drug to the future of this industry and the way that, you know, there will be a subscription model that's created and it will be sold through your online ordering platform, uh, retail, all of these different revenue streams that we're going to need to make sure that when the next pandemic hits, we don't sink. All of this is going to be happening through our dig the digital experience that we're putting out there. And online ordering is going to be an essential element of that. I agree. And I do not want to overlook the fact that, you know, I mean, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, Squarespace purchased talk. And I think that we can't miss understand the importance of that moment because we are now dealing with a shopping platform. That's not Shopify, which is a whole different level of shopping and e-commerce, just purchased an entire database of consumer behavior on reservations, pickups, boxes, CSAs, they're going to be running at it. And I think that it's going to be, it's going to transform in the next six months, how a lot of restaurants have access to their own. Cause I think there's plugins that are happening like subscription models and so on. They're going to be able to do their own. They're going to be able to natively do their own. And I think that we just can't ignore the importance of that. It's a brave new world. <laughs> oh, we have a couple in the Q and A. Let me see if I can access this. Elizabeth, can you see those questions? Uh, let's see. I can. I cannot because I have my screen on full screen. Can oh. you read those for me? Yeah, the first one is, can you talk more about subscription? And also I'm really bad. I'm, this is, I'm now telling everyone this on the screen but I'm actually severely dyslexic. So I'm, I, it takes me to while. I have a hard time reading. Um, my, um, the second question is my business has always offered delivery and we do not use third party. We don't use third parties like DoorDash. Now that place, now that place like McDonald's deliver is there any data on how much businesses, how much business being lost by business such as mine, for instance, down 10%, et cetera? Great question. Let me read that again. Let's start off with the first one. Can you talk more about yep. subscription? So subscription, I mean, in terms of like having the routine purchasing power. So for, I think the, mo the most um, tangible one that people have probably experienced most in their lives or not in their lives, have, have experienced because it's been a kind of a, a common thing in wine, the wine world is subscription models on wine and wine purchasing. So everyone, you can get a quarterly and monthly or whatever you choose per month. And I think subscription is interesting, particularly for restaurants, because you can basically sit there and create a unique menu that has a unique offering saying it's a, this month is this particular dish and you can, you can, or CSA box or merchandise or whatever it is for your company that makes sense. And then you can have a guaranteed predetermined quantity in which to sell. And I think that that's why it's, it, I think we'll get down to a little bit, but I think when it comes down, when a lot of people ask about profitability, I think the one thing I actually am more interested in is the consistency factor of restaurants. Like how do we make them more consistent, not necessarily profitable. I mean, hopefully profitability comes with that, but how can we predict consistency and continuity? And I think things like subscriptions are proving to be a reliable way to indicate interest and have knowing in advance what you're going to purchase for people. Absolutely. Um, so I, would, I hope that answers that for Katie's question. For Dan, um, always I've heard about, sorry, I have to read it again. Um, delivering now uses third-party DoorDash. Okay. I'm interested, Dan, I don't know if you can answer me, but what you are using if you're not using DoorDash. I'd, I'd love to jump in there as well. And I, I would say, uh, I, I would say that, you know, if the fear is losing business to third party, I don't really know if it works that way. I, I think that, you know, yeah. what third party does best is it's a marketplace. And so third party does a great job of driving new traffic to your business. Um, where I believe it falls short is it stands directly in the middle of the transaction and prevents you from enjoying the, the reoccurring business that you've earned without paying those commissions. I, I would say that for the most part, uh, if, if you are a niche cuisine, once you've earned that business, that's yours. I don't think anybody's out there shopping for a new pizza joint or a Chinese restaurant um, once they found one that they like. So repeat business once earned is pretty sticky. So I, I would argue that the only business that you're potentially missing out on is that top of funnel business uh, from all of the potential people that are unaware of your offering and could potentially find out about it through third-party delivery. 
I couldn't agree more. And I think that there's value in having more. It's like, I would see it more of like serving a digital ad on, on social media. It gives exposure, but the lifetime value and the average order of that person and the consistency and the continuity of like becoming engaged and coming to further and further down the funnel is less likely than someone who's purchasing directly through their website, who's called you or is picking up directly. I think that although they, you may lose one person every day, but they may have only come once and you're better off, in my opinion, not better off. It, it will serve the business in the longer term to turn attention to people that are like coming in and you're holding on to as like a lifetime, like getting further and further down the funnel. I agree. We'll put Josh. Well, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question up is uh, what key performance indicators should I focus on when measuring success? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, I would say internally, um, I would say for internally, it's definitely retention, team retention and meeting revenue goals. I think those are the two internally that you can kind of just really see being like, are people staying? Are they happy? As we talk about more of this, like personal, like person capital in, in, the, in the companies. And then the revenue goals of saying, are, is our average order value up? Are we getting enough um, butts and seeds for lack of a better term? And, you know, and I think when it comes down to, so that's kind of the internal side and like cash flow and a lot of those like more business model operational decisions staying lean, understanding your PNL, getting your admin costs down, having a good tech stack, all those will impact that. On the other side, I would say more of the external, it's going to be, I think that we can't ignore in terms of KPIs, particularly is, is people on the customer side. And that comes from customer acquisition, retention and engagement, people who remain engaged in your audience and in your restaurant. And then eventually like people who become event, um, who are then speaking upon your behalf of your restaurant, you know, and I think that we can kind of keep all those. I, I, I think it's, I think retention is like so important because right now we knew, I mean, the amount that everyone in March when doors shut and we had to go digital, everyone was clamoring for retention. I think it's proved to us that, that was the most important thing that we can own is understanding who we're talking to, cultivating hospitality in our guests and our teams. And that those were such pain points because from that, then you get cash flow and doors open and all these things. But those two major key points I, I think are, are the biggest KPIs. It doesn't necessarily go back to your PL and to your, but I think they all it will impact it directly. Well, and I Absolutely. I think it all kind of falls under the banner of owning your customer, right? Like really seeing it that way, even though they might only come into your restaurant once a month, it's about engaging with them on a regular basis, providing value in, on a regular basis. And I think that throughout the pandemic, we were able to really clearly redefine that through, uh, you know, uh, cooking demos online and all of these different opportunities that we had to communicate with them because it was the only way to see them, right? you know? Absolutely. And then the more you were, and I think too, even I, I go back to like the whole, we turned to technology and kind of this, like even thinking about just bringing up the social media example again, it's, you know, the beginning when Instagram was starting and it was all about your followers, right? But then it quickly, when people were trying to determine what a brand's worth was or their, their kind of their stickiness, it became engagement. It quickly became engagement because people could get as many people to follow, but if people weren't engaged in the audience, then it's kind of, when people are deciding who to work with. And I think that there's, there's again, a lot to be taken from that as we think about who for us, what it's that, yeah, I'll leave with that besides, you know, going in circles. Well, but no, but I, I, think I, think it's, I think it's a great point. I mean, it, from the first conversation you and I ever had, it was all about what can the hospitality industry learn from the industries that are thriving in this moment? And, and, and I think that when you talk about uh, employee retention, customer retention, engagement, things like that, if we begin to, to adjust our focus, I think everything else kind of falls into place, right? I agree. And it's a little Next. softer. It's not a number. It's not, I mean, it is a number. It can be a number if you know your data, but it's a little, it does feel a little soft for some people, I imagine. But I do think if you can put that to numbers and actually make a value to it and understand the average order and the, the lifetime value of that customer. And I think that it be, can become a very key KPI that is quantifiable. Absolutely. And, and Lord knows we've already had so many conversations about COGS and labor um, and that those conversations alone weren't enough uh, to ensure the solvency uh, of 
the industry. And so right. I, I think a lot of the intangibles you're talking about need to be watched. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, what, are some, what are some of the strategies I can use to cut costs and increase profits? Sign me up. <laughs> I know we're that easy to name, name them. Um, and again, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I think I would rather replace the word in this instead of profit is consistency and predictability because you know, I think that that's, that's really important that profit, I think without understanding those consistencies, we don't even understand the profitability of our company. And I would say, I go back to team retention. I think labor is really important. Um, customer retention being the second, in my opinion, of highest. And then, then it comes down to the whole three, right? It's labor, food and bev cogs, and then understanding your admin, PL cash flow, any of those other, that, those are like the three buckets we always think about as restaurants. And I almost, almost gar- like recommend when people are setting up their company and thinking about profitability, I always always say, start with what, what is your goal? Like what does success look like for you in five or 10 years? Being like, is it X percent profit? Is it, t- is it double X percent profit? And then figure out, is that, is that a possible, you know? But I think that for terms of strategies, I think we have to start. And the reason why I bring that up is I think we really have to start with understanding your business model and understanding like, is it, you can want to increase your profitability, but is it even possible given labor cogs admin? And then if it isn't, then A, either decide whether or not that's going to be viable as a business or secondly, figure out in that business model, where can we adjust? But I do think we have to almost start off with like understanding that initial business model. And I think- what we talked about in, in April, Josh is like last year as we talked about some tangible ones were cross training, thinking about labor, but then also thinking about rent agreements and thinking about how can we restructure some of those, what we call it like fixed admin costs or fixed costs and mostly being administration and administrative. But I think that that's where I would, I would start. If I, if I could throw in my two cents, please raise prices. Yes, I, I, yes. It is just, it is just, it's a conversation. I know I, if you listen to the shows, you hear me say it constantly. It, it's the only conversation to be had in, the, in this area is, you know, people are used to paying what they can tolerate for food instead of what it costs. And if you want to make a certain dollar amount in profit, you start there. And then you ask yourself, how do you, you know, how do I want to run my business? Do I want to offer subsidized health care, 401ks, the whole nine yards, bake that in. And then once you figure out what the true cost of running your business is, that will dictate what you charge on your menu. And then, and look, this is someone that that sold two restaurants and, and closed one down in the last 14 to 16 months. So, I, I mean, I, I can tell you from personal experience, like at some point we have to focus less on survival and more on thriving. And, and that's where the pricing conversation lies is what do we need to do to be able to not only support our team in the way they need to be supported, uh, not only pay our rent, but also be able to pay our mortgage as well. And so uh, pricing is the easiest way to do it. And I would argue that if we don't adjust pricing today in this moment where there's a lot of attention on our struggle and patrons are more pliable than they've ever been ever, it's going to be really hard to do it six months or a year from now. I could not agree more. I'm so with you on that. And I think about every other industry that we talk, like, well, first off, not only, I mean, the conversation around supply chain and the impact, if we don't do that on the entire trickle effect of everyone that's around the industry that impacts between the farmers and supply chain, et cetera. And on top of that, we, when I think about other industries in the like broadest sense of hospitality that we would interact with is, you know, we think about travel as being the most probably tangible airlines and hotels increase their price when the demand is high period. And we have this fixed cost and expectation of what we expect food to cost. And I think that that's just not, and I'm with you. I think that we have to increase costs and we have to educate, you know, and I'm not saying being self-righteous in education. I just think that we have to educate because we have to meet the customer where they are and we need to get there together because if they aren't willing to buy it and we can't survive, we're really in a pickle. So I just feel like we have to find like some middle ground. And I think that does come with education. I think that too comes with all like the additional 
tip included. I mean, that was the conversation the you know USHG and Danny Meyer were having many moons ago, trying to change that in Tarlow in New York. And I think that it's we have to. There's going to be this delicate balance, but hopefully we can get this groundswell that like all independent restaurants agree. And maybe organizations like the IRC or whomever else kind of step up to sit there and say, we are a unified front and we were going to push this together so no one's left out to dry. But I'm, I'm so with you, Josh. I think that's a really, really valuable point. I hate to spend time on the soapbox, but like, you know, I, I went to the gas station the other day and I tanked up and the price was different than the last time I went to the gas station. Yeah. I didn't lose my mind. They have variable costs. We in the restaurant industry have variable costs. Um, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with adjusting your price to compensate for that. I remember when limes quadrupled in price a couple of years ago. It was yeah. it was bananas. And yet the price of a margarita was static. Yes, I remember that. I remember they're like not couldn't juice them. And anyone oh that like left half one out and they got dried up, it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh yes the, yeah, the great lime debacle of 2017 yeah. it was an absolute <laughs> nightmare <laughs> i remember that gosh that's funny forgot about here's it a, too <laughs> yeah here's a great question and super timely what are some strategies you've used to ensure uh equity pay for staff oh there's so much going on right now on this front and i think the conversation really took off in last march and i think there's things like we've already brought up tip included kind of what we call employee profit sharing, right? It's like everyone pools and here we are pool tipping. Um, I think that one I've been seeing a fair amount, particularly having just gone up to New York is the kind of recovery surcharge that people are putting on um, where people, they just literally on the menu being like, we have included an X percent recovery surcharge and this is why. And again, it comes back to education, like tell why. I think it's always answering the question, why? Why are we doing this? Just to, just to kind of put a stake in the ground, in my opinion. Um, we've also early in the pandemic, we're talking about things like, and this is not necessarily applicable only to restaurants. I'm kind of thinking broader scope of like hospitality and it's, what does a co-op look like? You know, what, what, what does a, and like an ESOP, which is an employee, um, stock ownership plan, which usually falls more to CPG and larger scale that you can predict a lot more factors. But I think that those are kind of the most common or not common, the most prevalent choices. And then we also have team bonus structures. And I think that all of that really impact what we can do to change the strategy of equity. And I think in general, and this comes back to the food, cost of food, the cost of labor just has to go up. The, what we pay people on a day and we tips are rightfully so questioned across the nation. And the, the inclusion of like a real low base rate offset by tips and the difference between front of house and back of house. I think we have to leave, like level the playing field. And I think in some restaurants will have a hard time hiring accordingly because there will be the next restaurant next door. will do a low base rate with tips and people will choose that path. But those who want healthcare and benefits, if, if assuming the intention to change the equity pay is because they want to provide that, you know, I think hopefully we'd start turning the tide more in that direction. Because I think we'll all rise. I think we'll all be better off for it. I would also add is, is someone to do this for a living, like it's painful, like it's hard. It, it, it's hard to elevate prices and have that conversation. And then, you know, do, do the same. It, it was just, you know, for us, one of the reasons that we went to a, a whole house pool uh, was because it, it was too hard to look at a cook that was working 40 hours a week, making half of what a server working 20 hours a week was making and it's it's grueling I, I mean i don't know how many back of house people are, are listening right now but you know i used to stand in the expo window and it was hot and i wasn't in the kitchen i was on the other side of the window yeah. and i mean it, it's just grueling and you're, you're cutting yourself and you are burning yourself and it is high pressure and the margin of error is zero um and, and so you know it, I, I think the only way that, that we're able to ensure uh, equity in, in both pay and benefits um, is to mandate it as employers. And then, you know, it's, it's like making that decision, in my opinion, just like when we decided to go carbon neutral, the hardest part was making the decision. And then they just fall like dominoes. We've made this decision. What's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Until eventually you do get there. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've even talked to some operators that are, they're smaller teams, 
but, and I think that's, it depends. Like when we have to answer this question, it's really based on the scale of your operation, but they're putting everyone on salary and they're sure. only opening up the amount of days that they can work, the amount of hours in which they've allocated for their salary. And they will not open otherwise during the other operating hours. And like, that's a choice they've made. And everyone knows exactly what they're making when they walk in. And I think there was some feedback saying, well, then that's not motivating people. It's like, that's not fair. Every organization is motivated by like the consistency in the healthcare as I think motivation for people to have a quality of life that otherwise may not be on the table for different pay arrangements. And I, I just think that I'm with you. I think we have to kind of, it's gotta go a little different. I can't wait for it. Well, and the other side of the coin is this, you know, speaking as an owner and as an operator, it's it's not inspiring for anyone listening, I'm sure to hear that it, like you have to experiment, right? Especially during this difficult time. But that's what it's going to require for real innovation, for lasting innovation. Um, for, for everyone that's ever been approached by a salesperson uh, in the restaurant industry, we always ask the same question, right? Who in my neighborhood is using it, right? You, you want to see that it works for someone else before you're willing to do it yourself. And so I, I think the bravest of us that, that, that are trying to figure out what the labor model of the future looks like and what what pay equity looks like in the future of this industry. I, I, I think that there are probably several of those people listening right now. And I, I am so excited to see what you guys come up with. Same. Time for live Q&A. <laughs> These I'm are great questions. Thank show. you. All right. So we're a team of eight. Do you think looking at health insurance slash retirement will get us out of the it's a gig industry feeling that you mentioned at the start of this session? I, I'll let you take it first, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I definitely, I think it, what a difference it makes to provide people that. I mean, absolutely. I do find that it's hard for restaurant industry to get access to healthcare at a reasonable cost. And I think that's a huge issue that we're too high risk could be usually be included in PEOs. And then it's hard to find economical decisions for small restaurant groups. But I do think that if you're, there are, there are plans out there that at least provide incidentals and like kind of a baseline care. And hopefully over time there can be, we can keep growing that. I would, we actually even looked in this at Oyster Sunday about if we were to come on with multiple restaurants, like what, how could we make that possible to get a, get a mass scale, to be able to get a, uh, a policy and there's all kinds of limitations to that, but you know, I hope one day that the healthcare industry can actually serve, like, serve this industry as well. And more, but I do agree that it's very, it's important, and we will be turning a corner if you can provide that. I would also say, so I, I I've had you know bars that employed twelve people and in full scale, six thousand square foot restaurants that that employed sixty plus people. Um, and, and what we did for the smaller locations um, was we offered the employees like a bonus program where if they showed us, they, they were because we weren't able to put them on our in, on our health care plan um, because they were separate companies. Um, but what we did was we said, if you have health care, bring us the bill and we'll give you one hundred and fifty dollars a month. And, and, yeah. and that's it. And, and if we know that, that you have ongoing health care, we will help subsidize it with cash. Um, and, and whether they chose to use it for that or not doesn't really matter. It, it shows it shows us trying to incentivize in, uh, stability in what is a very unstable industry. And I, I do think that that went a really long way to building loyalty and, and building a culture where they're looking out for our best interests because they know that we're looking out for their best interests long term. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think even just the more broad like public plans and that if you can do that and offset a certain amount of it, then at least they can guarantee what their commitment is. I totally, I totally agree with that, Josh. And then Katie asked, uh, we built in gratuity so we can support fair wages to support our staff on decent wages. We pay them $20 plus an hour uh, and provide health benefits. We pay 60%. Katie, I'm coming to work for you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but we still get uh, bite backs from customers because they feel like the tips are forced. Um, do you think the industry is going towards this trend, 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 or do we need to change our messaging? What do you think, Elizabeth? I think we are more and more. I'm not, Katie, I'm not sure where you're located, but um, I do think we are going more and more. And I think the more that there's 
I mean, I appreciate, again, I bring up USHG and Tarlo, who both of which have kind of come back on that, but they kind of came out the gate early. But I think we're in this kind of rising tide right now that hopefully more and more across the nation do it where it's more normalized and I, in quotes. Um, so I do think that the more we do it as a group and have a precedent of what it can look like and how it can work, and we share that information with each other, which I think is knowledge is power. And I think it's really important on this industry. Um, I think that the customer will they may choose not to come back, but I think that most will. You know, the only thing I would add to that is, and, and it's something that I go back and forth with, which is, you know, it, how tricky do we need to be? Can we be, can we be transparent? You know, if it was, if it was up to me, we, you know, there wouldn't be percentages added and recovery percentages and this percentage for healthcare added. It's like, it's all baked into the price and the price is the price mm -hmm. and, and you can pay it and you can see the value in it or you can cook at your house. Um, but but it, at the end of the day, when we look at the expectation of the customer and it's an expectation that we set, not an expectation that they pushed off on us. They believe that they can sit down at a restaurant at 6 p.m. that was staffed up at 8 a.m. to start prepping and that after eight hours worth of work, they're able to, to be presented with a meal that's at a, at a discounted rate without needing to pay everything that was involved in that process. Um, I, I, I think so much of it comes down to a conversation and, and storytelling. And I think that uh, I think that people are primed for it. I think that that message can be told on social media um, through our menus and, and through the verbiage that we choose to use on the menus. Um, but, but I also think a lot of it is, is going to come down to ultimately like trying to treat adults like adults. And if people come in and they don't get it, you know, it, it's not going to be for everybody, but you hope that there are enough people that get it and support us as an industry that we're able to move forward. Because I, I mean, I think everybody, I think healthcare is a right. And, and I think that a living wage is a right. And we as an industry have to stand up and do that. And I'm not talking from an ideological perspective. I'm talking from a really, really practical perspective. I'll get off my soapbox. I promise. No, I don't um, think it's great. I agree. Um, totally agree. And then uh, to move on to the chat, we are a ghost kitchen right now, but we are seriously considering a storefront. Would now be a good time to transition? Great question, Daniel. <laughs> um, I would ask Daniel as well as why? Why would you want to? You built the ghost kitchen. I'm just wondering because I would. I think there's another, maybe some more information under there. But um, I'm so intrigued by ghost kitchens. I'm I'm interested to see where they go. I think that ghost kitchen. If if you find that you're, I think, let me back up. If you're a ghost kitchen and you're finding that you're losing traction for customer base because maybe they're going more to in-person dining, then I could see a moment and why you would do a brick and mortar and like do a storefront. If you feel like that would those, if you're in a location, you feel like your audience would come and join you there. Um, if it's meant to be just to have one, I, I think I just want to kind of want to tease that out a little bit more. I feel like ghost kitchens are so interesting. I've been following, um, I don't know if y'all have heard about like Jack Asperito in Philly from Steven Starr. He did a, he's doing a ghost kitchen right now. That's mm -hmm. a full brand built off being one. There's no brick and mortar. And I think that I'm, I would track that just to see, I'm just so intrigued to see what goes there. But to answer your question, I, I would want to know what, what do you think would be the value add of adding one? And is it necessary to have to retain your customer current customer base? Or is it meant to acquire new? I, I would also, you know, to, to, to answer the question with something Elizabeth has said many times is I think the data will tell you the story. You know, the first question is, you know, based on how you're operating the ghost kitchen, do you have access to your customer base? Are you able to talk to them? Could you send out, you know, a, a poll paired with a coupon that says, you know, if we opened a brick and mortar in your town, how likely are you to, to come by and visit? I, I think that there are real opportunities there to have that conversation. I, uh, I don't know if I would ever open another restaurant as blindly as I opened the last three. I, I just, I, I didn't do any environmental research and I didn't see you know, what would be the best fit? It was like, this is the area I live in, or this is the area I want to invest in. I'm from Louisiana. This is going to be my concept. And we, we just rolled with it. And, and I, I think that the data can really tell a story. I, I think about guys like uh, Johnny Ray's own in Los Angeles. They, they took Helen Ray's from a food truck to a brick and mortar. 
And the guy was an overnight success. It took him half a decade to build to an overnight success. But when he opened the brick and mortar, it was a booming business in a bad location out the gate. But it's, it's because he had laid the foundation, he had seen the data, and he knew that there was enough demand to support that location. Um, so, I, you know, Daniel, I think it's a great question, but I think the data would probably give you that answer. Mm -hmm. Michelle asks, we just opened with Strictly Takeout in December of 2020 in a ski resort. What is the best way to understand our data so that we can adjust our hours and storefront space accordingly moving forward? And I guess this is meant to be because they're opening up for service, is my yes. assumption. Um, I would... I would wonder about the, what the ski resorts, how it's performing, like who's in there, how's it coming along, what's the cadence usually of, now it's hitting summer, like how many people usually come to the ski resort and during what time of day, are they there for hiking in the morning or like the outdoors in the morning or they night? Um, I, I would first, I guess, first start with like environmental decision-making of like how you plug into that cadence and then I would also transition understanding of the takeout. Was it primarily lunch or dinner? Was it early in lunch or not? Did you have a late night crowd that picked up food to go and then make that decision? And then I think back to Josh's point of trial and error a little bit, like you can always adjust your hours. I think it's better to expand them than to restrict them. Um, in my opinion, you always kind of start with, you know what your core time is and then one hour more and one hour more and see what happens or open up for another service. But um, that's, that's probably where I would start. I hope that answers your question, Michelle. I, I interviewed uh, Susan Sarich from Suzy Cakes. And I think you can also get creepy with your environmental research. She sat in parking lots uh, <laughs> of Good for you her. Know, not, not, not identical businesses, but kind of corresponding businesses thinking, you know, this is about the square footage I'm looking for. This is the average check size. She would just sit in the parking lot and see day by day how many people would come in uh, and out and, you know, how big the bags were that they were walking out with that we, she could create estimates based because once she knew how much they were probably making, she knew how much she could probably make. And then that determines, you know, every other facet of the business from the, the lease rate that she chose to hours of operation, uh, the whole to, to pricing, the, the whole nine yards. So I, I think that um, outside of, you know, looking at all of your data, I think you can look at the data from uh, corresponding and competitive businesses as well. And go in there. I mean, look at their websites, go eat at them. I told it, yeah, definitely. I think it's always nothing like primary research right there. Absolutely. Oh, and then Katie says... Uh... Oh, she's just being complimentary, which is absolutely lovely. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, Guy said he would love to have a session focused on pooling, service charges, equity pay. The entire arena is what scares a pop and pop operation like ours. Guy, I would say yes. Um, Lord knows there are so many facets of this industry, especially during this pivotal time that, that scare the heck out of me as well. So I, I agree with you. I think that would be a great topic. Um, we are at the one hour mark. Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, where can people find you online? Oh, yes. We are at um, oystersunday.com and Sunday is in the day of the week, just to clarify, because um, there's a food podcast. And um, we, so oystersunday.com, you can find us at our handle on Instagram at, at oystersunday. And then I personally am elizabeth at oystersunday.com if you'd like to get directly in touch with me. And then just to harken back to something you brought up initially that, that I think everybody should totally check out, the, uh, the Oyster Sunday resources are not to be believed. I, if you want to see alternative ways to run your business, how the innovators in the industry are doing it, uh, they have case study after case study on their website. Uh, they're doing the Lord's work and they should be supported for it. So thank you so much for your efforts, Elizabeth. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Uh, this has been the town hall featuring Elizabeth Hilton of Oyster Sunday. Um, join us next month. We'll see you then. Thank you.